Welcome, everyone. We're going to get started. We are thrilled to have you all here tonight to help us celebrate the work and words of American artist Monique Prieto. Immediately after her lecture, please join us in the Duke Gallery down the hall for the opening reception of Ms. Prieto's exhibition revival. Monique Prieto is a Los Angeles-based artist. She has had solo exhibitions throughout the United States and Europe, including Acme Los Angeles, Kyman Reed, New York, Pat Hearn, New York, Corvi Mora, London, Il Capricorno, Venice, and the list goes on. Her work is in many important public collections, including the Museum of Contemporary Art, Los Angeles, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, and the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston. Her work has been included in many important and diversely themed group exhibitions. These themes have included things such as color, abstraction, text, and the, theor the theoretical identification of the differences between being stoned and being drunk. As you will see, uh, as she projects images during her artist talk and then in the exhibition down the hall, Miss Prieto's work aims to please, or at least on the surface of it. And as all painters are, Prieto is intimately involved with surfaces. As her work has moved and shifted over the years, her particular and peculiar color palette has been a constant. But like with the early admirers of abstract Philip Guston, no one knew the strange creatures, or in Prieto's case, words that were lurking below the surface of those beautifully, minimally abstract paintings. There's that word again, surface. Prieto's colors and shapes and seemingly simple quotidian words are rendered with an optical dazzle and are sweet to the taste. Those elements give exactly enough to keep you coming back for more. This is, I think, the reason Christina Valentine, in her excellent essay for the exhibition publication, mentioned the allure of junk food, the crisp crunch and tart taste of a Dorito chip, or the smooth slushiness and sweet seduction of a Slurpee. However, her work is, of course, not eye candy. It is not at all just saccharine and slush. In Valentine's essay, she focuses in on a 2014 work on paper that is in the exhibition titled Polka. I want to quote how Valentine articulates it, but then use it to speak to what I think Prieto's work does to its surroundings which of course includes us. As return visitors waiting in line for a Slurpee, we will always be part of Prieto's work's surroundings. The way Valentine puts it in her description of Polka, she says that the paint gently puckers against the paper. The paint gently puckers against the paper. It's beautiful, right? Valentine then continues to talk about what the paint optically does, which has everything to do with our eye, right? But in her carefully worded phrase, I think we are asked to consider the paint's effect on the paper itself. You will see when you witness this work in the exhibition, as with any wet paint medium on a thin stock piece of paper, Paint gently puckering against a paper causes the paper to physically buckle. This phrase, I think, sets up this really lovely situation where the objects in the room, I in front of the paint, and the paper behind the paint are indelibly affected. As the paint gently puckers against the paper, I believe the paint also gently puckers against me. In this exhibition, we, the paper and me, 
find ourselves buckling and swaying, each in our own way, of course, to the insistent effects of Prieto's deceivingly complex paintings. Please help me welcome Monique Prieto. artist appreciates, I mean, there's nothing an artist appreciates more than carefully considered thoughts from the viewer, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> <I'm> very moved. <laughs> um, thank you for having me, Stephen, for inviting me, and um, APU community, and I'm going to try to move this um, and welcoming here, me here to the gallery. I'm going to um, talk to you. I know most of you here are students, so I'm going to speak to you as someone who was once a student, um, and it's a long time ago, but um, I'm going to present work chronologically. Um, I think it's, for me, it's the, it's the clearest way for me to try to uh, translate to you how things might have evolved, and I want to um, let you know that, um, that it is the case this far down 30 years into making paintings. I'm still learning what it is that I'm up to, still um, uncovering um, you know, hidden kinds of uh, 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 just agendas that I had no idea were operating in for such long periods through threads. So um, uh, sometimes you're discovering things with me as I'm speaking. And if you can't hear me, just let me know. Also, I'm really happy to stop and answer a question if you want to raise your hand, or I will, uh, I'll let you do that at the end. So we're beginning at the beginning of my um, work in the public space. So this is a piece called Bounce, and it's 1994. I went to CalArts. It was the, the site for um, uh, a kind of refusal to uh, consider painting as a viable medium any longer. It was the wrong place for me to be at the time, but um, apparently it was the right place for me to be at the time. Um, my senior thesis show, this was the final piece as you came around the three walls, um, as I said farewell to my uh, grad days. Um, and uh, you might surmise um, that I was feeling not so jubilant. Um, where I found myself with painting was, you know, the monochrome, the, the pieces are literally prone like a body, uh, they're the colors of earth, like something that's been buried, and all I've been thinking about and considering for the time I was in grad school was, uh, if painting is dead and I still continue, I, I insist on continuing to try to find a way to do it, find some life in it, uh, where is that life? So it was a kind of a, a, a playful but a, a wishful kind of uh, imagining of, if the painting is dead, it's buried in the ground, this is what it looks like. I named it Bounce because I was hoping for it to bounce back before my eyes. A kind of revival, you know, revive the painting from the dead. So that, that's where my, my uh, journey started, really, was trying to uh, find a way to take apart painting and find little bits that I can continue forward, maybe breathe a little life into them. Uh, this is a painting called Platt, and um, the very summer after 1994, I went to Skohegan and I met a lot of really great young artists and people there. And um, one thing that struck me with people who were continuing to paint, because there were still painter, there were a lot of painters coming out of the East Coast, um, was that there was room in painting at that time for a sense of humor. Um, so I started to kind of think about um, what were ways to kind of introduce a lightheartedness while still kind of grappling and juggling like the, the tropes of modern painting. So there's the grid, and the grid for, um, you know, an abstract painter represents rationality, and, you know, it's the anti-feeling. So if we're, if we're going to continue making painting, gosh darn it, it better not have a lot of feeling in it. So um, we got to figure out how to do that uh, with a kind of order, you know, thinking Mal Malievich and Mondrian. So thinking of them, I'm thinking, uh, what if the, the grid starts oozing? What if the grid is not such severe, you know, so severely colored? Maybe it's lighthearted. Maybe it starts to, um, you know, literally uh, 
depend on itself and uh, let it, you know, kind of have inter you know, uh, the kinds of relations that happen between people where you, know, you, you think something's there for you, it is, it isn't, it's holding you up, it's maybe going to slip away, you don't know. But um, I, uh, I, I started to, uh, this is 1995, so I started, as you can see, the grid starts to melt away kind of before your eyes. Um, I'm, I'm beginning to represent in, um, in paint, for me, what was a very real um, experience in my life of, you know, relationships changing. But, um, you know, I've had my first baby, I'm trying to make these paintings that are, you know, uh, representing the very grave and serious kinds of events that are happening in my life while um, also recognizing that because I actually am having these experiences like bringing a baby into the world, pushing it out, and feeding it, being responsible for it, my husband and I caring for it, that this, the concerns of making a painting or being an artist actually fall, they just, they pale in comparison. And, and that kind of perspective starts to feed into the work. And I feel at that time really enabled, ironically enough, enabled me to work better and um, more clearly. Uh, this is a, a painting called um, Grand Slam. Um, all of these paintings of this time are acrylic on canvas. Um, the canvas was primed, um, uh, matte medium primed, so it looks like it's unpainted, but um, the shapes are all a few coats of their each and their discrete colors. Um, and the drawings for these paintings I made ahead of time on the computer. Um, this was, you know, 1995, so I'm using Painter One, and um, I've got a baby on my left hand, arm, arm sucking from the breast, and I'm drawing with my finger on a ridiculous touchpad on the right, and I'm printing them out um, black and white, and then I'm deciding what colors as I hold it and paint it, and the baby's on the mat on the floor next to me, and all of this I'm kind of figuring out as I go along. Um, this is a painting called Tower of Power, and it's a very tiny painting. Actually, it's got a lot of juice for a little tiny thing. Um, on the other side, um, this is from 1997. So the, the color choices, um, they're very um, clear. I, I, in my mind, when I'm making these paintings at this time, each shape in the painting represents a person, a feeling, an idea, all the elements that fill your day and how they sit beside one another, you know, so you're having a conflict, you're having a relationship, you're having an idea, and sometimes they sit well together, sometimes they need each other, sometimes they don't, sometimes they avoid each other, and sometimes there's slippage. So th this is where I was getting my content for trying to continue making a so-called abstract painting but at the time, when it was being talked about and, you know, people would ask me why this, why abstraction, why representation, I really felt, and I still continue to feel that there's a kind of representation for me, knowing where the paintings came from, they feel representational to me. Um, this is Superstars from 1998. This is Blue again. That's uh, 1999, and I'm kind of zipping through, <laughs> so you can slow me down, but um, we can also go back. This is Love Think from 2000. Most of the paintings are pretty good, right? Um, yeah, so, um, sorry, that's, a, that's like a, f a six by five painting, super, Superstars, and um, Blue Again is, is actually like a three by by two paintings, so they vary actually. Um, this is a, f a four, four by five painting. And when you said uh -huh. they, they feel representational, what, what might they be representing? Is it still the, the soft grid or the no, they're, they're like I, the, the content, I mean, I was drawing from, this, from my everyday life. Um, and, and it wasn't always clear, like in my mind, when I make a drawing on the computer, because all of these came from drawings I would make 
um, in the studio on the computer, I'd make the drawing kind of automatically in a way. And it was in interpreting it, picking the colors and, and kind of eyeballing it up to the canvas at the size I wanted that I would understand what it was that I had. It was like, ah, oh, that's all about that fight I had yesterday with my husband. And you know, and then this phone call came. And, and you know, this is not stuff that you as the viewer would need to know, but it's what I needed in order to make the painting because there, was, there were reasons for each thing to be the shape it was and the color it was and in relation to the thing next to it, whether it had tension or was giving in. Or, and these were, these were the blocks I was using in order to build the painting. So in that way, they, I mean, for you, <laughs> they all represent something, hopefully because abstraction has that great capacity to leave room for you to bring your own stories of the day to a piece. Um, for me, they're very much more specific. I, I know exactly what this painting is about. <laughs> it's called Warm Body, and it's um, it's 12 feet. It's, it's a very large painting. It's 12 feet long, I think 10 by 12 or so. And, uh, you know, it's essentially, I'll tell you. <laughs> it's essentially, it was an elegy. I had just one of my very ancient cats had died. And there were, it was the day, it was, it was that day, in, in all the aspects of that day, of, of losing that friend. Um, but uh, but I send it out there, and I sent it out there then, um, more as an open invitation for you to insert uh, what it is that you needed to see that day. Um, this is uh, still blushing from 2001. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm working this way, um, you know, in a, in a kind of formal and somewhat minimal way, and um, and the work's evolving a little. I'm kind of I'm, I'm I'm giving a little bit of space to what the the computer, you know, what it asserts. So you know, there's a line that sometimes I would just fill in the shape, and you know, I'm deciding to let some of the gaps of when I color with my finger on the little pad like that, and I don't get it all in. So the work is evolving in that way. Um, this is Departure from 2001, and I'm not sure why it's so tiny up there, but it's actually like a three by four foot painting. Um, I don't have the best slides in the world. Um, this is Interior from 2002. Um, so this is from the last show of work. Um, you know, I, I did it for about nine years work moving along in this vein and um and it was very satisfying but it was clear as i was going along you know that um i was evolving the world was changing and it only seemed right it was a nagging feeling that my work should somehow reflect the changes going on with myself with the art world with the world at large you know with, within the family all the kinds of you know context really should you should really give some space to the context that you're in. <laughs> and so this is what I was doing at the time. Um, these are, this is a temp, attempt. So at this period, I'm thinking that the work is becoming um, so m minimal to the point that um, it's so clearly about some very, um, it's becoming too much about myself because there's only so far I can go. <laughs> and I didn't, I don't, at the time I wanted to kind of have a separation of that kind of practice. Um, even if for the viewer, you wouldn't know what this painting, what this particular painting is about. For myself, I wanted the work to come from a place that was more about um, a larger kind of consideration, namely you guys. So um, at the end of this, this is uh, Blue Contact, um, that's also a very large painting. It's about uh, eight by ten um, and long haul. So uh, at the end of this show, I, I literally packed up and went traveling with my husband and my, by that time three kids. So I'd been raising a family during this time um, with my husband, who's a great guy. And um, and you know when you have kids, and some of you do. Um, or you have nephews or people you really love in the world, everything that happens in the world, um, you consider it in, through their eyes and through what they're going to experience of it as well. So the world is changing and I'm deciding I need somehow to let that, 
be reflected in the work. I took a break. <laughs> I gave myself two years to um, to kind of assess where I was at and see what would happen. I had no idea where I was going to go. Um, and it was a kind of a panicky situation. And um, as Brent, um, you know, <laughs> uh, kind of uh, hinted at, you know, things really changed. <laughs> and, um, what happened was, um, you know, the, a war broke out. So we were all um, kind of drawn into a larger drama than the ones that than the drama that we have of you know, the daily life or our own problems. It was, it's really hard to not uh, see how um, you know, war affects us all on all different kinds of levels. And one of the things that was happening at the time was there was a lot of anxiety, right? Everyone's very anxious. You either have loved ones who are going or loved ones you've lost or you know, just you don't know what's next and that's a difficult way to feel. Um, felt like it was a good time to be sending out messages, and messages that were a little easier to get at than um, you know, uh, abstract painting where it's color and form. I wanted actual literal messages, but I didn't want to be like the, the, the source, the author of the messages, because I don't feel like I'm a writer, so uh, I came to look for a collaborator, and my collaborator ended up being someone who, um, an unlikely person, someone from 17th century. He's, he's a he, so he's a male. He's like as far away from me as possible. It seemed like the right time to bring someone close to me who was like um, unlikely, right? To make a connection when at a time when we're all thinking about how distant we are from each other and how we may or may not like this or that person. So I pick someone who's a male. He's British. He's from another century. He's, you know, a naval officer. Uh, he, we have nothing in common. He's got terrible bad habits. He's a philanderer. He's, a, he's just an adulterer. He, but, but he wrote these diaries in, in the 17th century. Um, I, I became familiar with them when I worked in the public library system. They're the first published library, I mean, diaries in the, in the English language. So um, when you open them, uh, you read them, and you immediately are struck, as diaries can do to you. Um, by how much you have in common with a complete stranger, right? So, uh, yes, he's a naval officer, he's a man, he's a you know, philanderer, but he, he's also anxious, he's spending, he doesn't, he's spending too much money, he really should quit smoking, the, the house renovations aren't going well, you know, his wife and he aren't getting along this week, and it's just the same banal concerns that we're having today, in these times, in this period on, you know, we're humans and we all have these issues. So. I started to take notes um, from Samuel Pepys' diaries and uh, used his words to, um, to abstractly send out a picture that you could complete, potentially, in your mind. So this is one of the very first ones, uh, and it was a test. And it's a Frenchman with one eye that was going my way. And it was, it was asking you to read it. Um, it's not easy to read. Um, and to complete the picture in your mind. I mean, what does a Frenchman look like, um, especially one with one eye, and going your way? Which way is your way? Is it you know, ahead of us, behind us, and down the road, up the mountain? Um, it's, it leaves space, hopefully, in, a, a, in, a, in an alternate way that a, an abstract painting of a red next to a blue does. It leaves space for you to fill in some of the content. Um, and thus, I launched into using text and painting, which was not something I foresaw. Um, so I continued with Samuel Pepys, and um, and uh, and and we moved down. We just got nine volumes, so we worked together for quite a while. Um, we uh, this is tide, the tide being against us when we were almost through. So I, I just what I would do is I would you know isolate bits of text from his entries, um, and I would pick things according to how much uh, potential there was for imagining what was being said, and um, and what you know the, the, for you the many ways of interpretation. I mean, what you might see. You know, what does a tide look like? If it's against you, is it a, is it a you know a metaphorical tide in real water? I mean, you're gonna it's you're gonna have all kinds of associations according to the kind of day, the week, the year you've had. So, um, 
it was it was a very fun <laughs> way to work um, and still abstractly because I'm not actually making a picture of a thing for you so it's it was an interesting way to arrive at um, playing with still color and form which I'm very much attached to and love to kind of juggle around um, and content which I feel is really important in painting whether it's abstract or not um, our eyes looking in parallel lines um, lines is misspelled uh, because that's why peeps spelled it at the time the English language was still kind of up for grabs as far as spelling goes Are these really text pieces this is a very large painting it's um, it's about the 10 or 12 feet long No, so I, I also, when I stopped working the other way, I stopped making my drawings on computers. Um, and part of what was fun for me in making these text paintings was that I would, um, once I'd chosen the text I was going to work with, I would launch into drawing it. I came up with this font myself. Um, and I would start with the last letter of the, of the last word first and work backwards and see how it all fit. So there was, there was, for me, it was a challenge in like letting it like come together and make sense uh, in a way that, there was a tendency if you write text the way that we're used to receiving it, that, that you would read it so quickly that you might not allow yourself to see something. And so I, I slowed it down by doing it backwards and making it a little awkward and clunky so that you might give yourself more space as you're trying to parse out what the words are to maybe start seeing some associations with the words. So um, the computer's not involved. It was totally just in the moment kind of improvisation on the canvas. Um, and with the armature of the, you know, the font that I made, and it's pretty much the same all the time. It's 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 clunky. It's blocky. It, you know, it has a kind of goofy illusionistic shadow. Um, the inside of the letters are unpainted, so you know, there's a relationship to the kind of acknowledging in the canvas that I had in the previous work. But everything around the words um, are is paint that is meant to kind of support what I'm what I thought when I read the piece and not necessarily, you know, especially not meant to or hoping not to close down the reading of the, of the phrase. So this is a thousand times better and more glorious than ever. This is yesterday and today. Those are from 2007. Um, this is Repent, Repent, and you can see this one up close in the gallery. Um, this is the yeah, diptych. Tomorrow morning. Tomorrow I can. And uh, we're getting close to the end of using use in painting, at least. Uh, this is consequence. Um, these last two paintings were, um, I, my thought was when a thought comes to you and you've been napping or sleeping or your eyes have been closed, and those that first moment when you start to just barely open your eyes and the world kind of starts to flood in, I was thinking of, I made a series of paintings that kind of addressed that moment with the words and the paint. Um, so that was Tomorrow I Can and Consequence. Um, I, uh, in uh, 2012, I was invited um, to go to North Carolina, to Raleigh, North Carolina, and the Contemporary Art Museum there and do a project on a, a very long wall. And um, what I did was, um, knowing that I was getting about to the end of my relationship with Peach, because I'm about at the end of nine 
9.9 volumes of his words, and my phrases, as you can tell from Consequence or Tomorrow I Can, are getting smaller and smaller, and I'm getting more and more kind of interested in just the individual words, even though they're his words, they're our words, because everybody uses the word and. But uh, so for this piece, um, I really wanted to um, invite the viewer to activate the painting. So um, it's called um, Elegy, and um, it's a series of, uh, of, of somewhat flaccid paintings, if you will. So they need to be opened by your hands, by each corner, so that you can read um, what's on each um, piece. So this is in the studio uh, piece, as you would see it hanging in the gallery. We put little plaques so people knew that they were allowed to touch the paintings. Um, and um, the words I painted on the back of the muslin with a spray can um, in, in script backwards, which was really fun to try to figure it out backwards. And then it comes through, so there's a kind of um, a nice kind of um, uh, a little representation of how language kind of always sits slightly out of your reach, um, or at least your ability to really um, sees it. So it, it literally comes from behind the painting, and then the, the color in the, on the muslin is on the front. Um, so uh, the piece, each piece is, in, you know, is made to be enjoyed uh, individually, but if one were to take the time to go down the line and open each one, and maybe hold some of it in your mind, it would read um, as a kind of meditation or reflection on, um, on maybe a metaphor for being in the studio. So it's, it's the sea being very rough, sailed all night, all night, and most glorious and much more. And uh, that's what it would look like if it was all opened at once. But it's completely, it's like a 3D interactive kind of painting because it's completely dependent on the person coming in and opening each piece and deciding which ones to open or not. Um, it was a way of involving the body, your body, our bodies in, in, the, in the painting. And it, it, it was a, a beginning of saying goodbye to peeps who I was sorry to see kind of our little relationship kind of trailing off. Um, the very last thing I did with peeps and his words, um, I took smaller bits of his text and made and kind of in, and two of them <laughs> in you know stone. They're so I made these ceramic uh, poems um, for a show here um, in twenty. What was it? I think it was 2012 as well. It's uh, a beautiful sight, like a chicken signifies nothing in the world. How clear the heavens below the clouds. And. The sky, birds, and other pretty novelties fall. Trees standing together, full of people. A great crowd, old and young, found the way after a song or two. Um, so that was the end of working with peeps. Um, and what I moved to next uh, was uh, a set of paintings that uh, were, again, kind of uh, reacting to, to the times that as, as I perceived them. So um, there was a lot of chatter amongst peers and in the world about, not the world, I mean, let's get this straight, <laughs> in the art world, in regards to painting. Um, uh, you know, should you be using your own hands to make your paintings? Should someone else be making your paintings for you? Should you be making them with a, you know, something other than yourself? And I just really enjoy making paintings myself. 
I just like the act of it. It's part of what's important to me. And so I, I, I launched into a, a, a set of paintings that were not only obviously made, hopefully obviously made with my own awkward hand, but also um, took their content from imagining um, two bodies dancing and the kind of movement that happens. And the name of the show that these paintings were in was called Hat Dance. And Hat Dance is the, the English um, title of uh, a traditional Mexican, a non-Mexican American um, uh, dance called Jarabe Tapatio, um, which you may have had to do or learn when you were a child in grade school. It's where they throw the hat on the floor and you go, da -da, da -da, da -da. <laughs> So it's, it's very innocuous and you know a mild dance now. But originally, when this dance appeared in the late um, 18th century, um, it, was, it was introduced by young people, young dancers. And it was a dance that represented a courtship. You know, and, in, and this is, you know, Mexico um, ruled under the Spanish, and um, it's a Catholic country, and um, there's not a lot of interaction between the sexes is supposed to be happening. So this dance was, uh, you know, just completely, um, you know, considered amoral. It's just banned immediately as soon as the kids perform this dance. No one ever touches anybody in this dance, but the, the representation of people coming close to each other and retreating, close again and retreating, was too much for the time. Um, in spite of it being banned, the young people continued to get together and do this dance. And it grew and it grew, and they would do it in secret. And what I found intriguing and kind of <coughs> potent for me in discovering this about this dance um, is that it just spoke to me about you know, my own beginnings with painting, I was like, it was something you're not supposed to do, it's meaningless or, or it's banned, you know, we don't do painting anymore, we do this other thing. And, and that there would still be myself and other people at that time and continue, you know, we're just gonna do it. <laughs> we wanna do it, it's painting, it's joy, it's really fun, it's, it's strange, you know, we, we're compelled, you know. And so uh, I named the, the show after that dance and I named each painting in the show after a dance. Uh, so this is Harabi Tapatino. Um, this is uh, Tarantella. Um, this is Boogaloo. These are uh, oil paintings. This is Fandango. I always have music going in my studio, uh, so I'm a, I'm, yes, I love music, I do dance myself for fun, and so it, it was not hard to imagine bodies dancing, and I would draw, it's completely improvised, I would load the brush and it's a big, I'm, you know, fatter than this microphone, load it with the color I mixed, and draw the the figure, each figure in one whole swoop. Um, this is bachata, I think. <laughs> sure it looks like it. <laughs> oh, so that that one's like a, a, that's like a seven by eight painting. Um, but this one is a more intimate kind of three, two by three um, And I, I'm just showing you some of them. This one, merengue. Um, also, my son at the time, um, my kids are all grown up now, but my son at the time was still in high school and he um, had taken an interest in, our, in that half of his heritage and had become a mariachi player. And so I was spending a lot of time driving him to his lessons and his gigs, and um, and I was watching a lot of folklorico. Uh, the, and you, if you've seen this, the the costumes are very ornate, and the skirts have these lovely ribbons all or, you know, on them, and the, the colors just kind of swirl around. So there was a lot in my visual field in those days that was informing um, these paintings. 
and this is Y two C. And um, I, I, let me say one more thing about the dance as a as a as a starting point for painting. There's uh, something else that it shares, I think, or that I like to think it shares, is that there's when you're doing dance, especially dances that have names, so dances that have names and then you have a partner, or generally a dance that someone has to show you how to do it, so you have to take the time to learn it. There's a certain amount of discipline involved. Um, but once you get the steps down, that's when the fun really starts. Then you can try to improv improvise, you can loosen up and just really have fun with it. And, you know, there's, there's great things can happen once you kind of get the, the basics down and I feel like that's a similar thing with the painting like if you just take a lot of time getting to know the medium you know the, the stuff of paint how color and form works you know push yourself to understand the mechanics of it then you can really loosen up and and like have fun with it become more fluid with it you know improvise and leave some some of the steps out and you know, add some steps of your own so it was just a fun show to do and thinking about the relationship between different disciplines in that way. Um, the, the most recent show I've done, it's another departure, and um, as you're learning, I'm full of departures, and I think that's important for painting, at least to keep painting alive. Um, I did a show last year, and it was called Just Listening, and there are a couple pieces in the, sh in the show here that, from that show. Um, you know, there's the phrase, just well, I'm just listening, which is I, I always strikes me as kind of funny because um, there's nothing there's nothing unimportant about just listening, right? When you meet someone who's a good listener, you're you're just you can't wait to see that person again because they they do something for you, they they, they soothe you, and um, I was thinking of painting, asking that question since I've been at it for a while and I've been thinking about it for a while and you know I've been kind of through that ringer of you know, why are we continuing to do it? And I, one thing I want to ask myself is, is why do we want so much from painting? Why do we put so much pressure on it to like, uh, to, to have so much importance, right? You know, the, the fact that we have to make proclamations, you know, painting is dead, we no longer, how can painting live? Why do we give it so much consideration in our lives and in our <laughs> practices when there's so obviously so many other things you know worthy of attention so this was a, a, a kind of a imagining of you know what if a painting were um, uh, an entity that was waiting for you in order to listen to you to unburden you in some way rather than you coming to it waiting for it to somehow answer your question why painting show me an important painting how are you important instead this painting is just all ears <laughs> waiting for you to to whatever to to let go of something so um they're pairs of ears and um each set has a little color game going on it's it's just four colors but they're kind of set in motion in a way that you know just a little ever so slightly tricksy and um they're very they're you know much larger than a real ear but much but much smaller than a painting normally is. So there, there are issues of scale that I'm playing with, and um, they're painted in such a way that uh, it's very clear, every little mark, like what, where I was in the painting in each moment that I made it. There's no, like the white is the first layer of white, and wherever there's more layers, it's very clear where the brush was. And that's just getting back to like in the dance paintings where it's, I want to make it very clear that my that I'm that I'm present when I'm making the painting, and uh, and I was there at least at that moment. Mm -hmm. So these paintings, besides that, um, are also named after snacks. <laughs> and and the thought with that is, you know, snacks have these they have these names that are very evocative and get you to want them. And um, and snacks also are something that I find a very endearing kind of um, uh, kind of signifier of our own state, which is imperfection, right? We're, we're imperfect, just like painting. You're never gonna find a perfect painting. You're never gonna find a perfect person. And 
What does an imperfect person do? They eat snacks. They eat bad snacks. They eat shrimp chips and you know Slurpees and Cheetos. So, so these these paintings are each named after you know uh, snacks. So there's Orange Julius and uh, <coughs> Slurpee, and Creamsicle, Shrimp Chip. Cheeto and V8. Now V8, we all fool ourselves and think it's really healthy, right? It's, it's got a lot of salt and high fructose corn syrup. But uh, I, there's a, you know there's a certain amount of why I would name them after these snacks. For me, it, it's because there's a certain amount of um, immediate satisfaction that we seek from these kinds of snacks, right? You're, you're on the road, you want something quick that's going to give you a, a quick pick-me-up. And the, the sound, the smell, the, all of those things get into play in, in choosing it. But it, I felt like that, that quick satisfaction that we're looking for spoke to what it was I was trying to get at and trying to understand what it is we're trying to get from a painting when we continue to stand in front of it now. And that's where I'm going to leave this because that's where I'm, where I am right now. <laughs> I'm thinking about painting, and I'm happy to answer questions for you now. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? No. You should come and see the show because it's always better to see a painting in person than on a screen. It's my favorite way to look at them. Yes. Sure. Um, I consider color a very personal uh, part of one's arsenal, and I think it's. I encourage um, when I do teach, I encourage my students to really think about their own relationship to color. Um, so my color comes from very clear, sometimes not always clear, but very strong um, associations that I've built up over the years. So it's part of what I think each person individually has inside them as their own particular strength, is their own palette. And I know it sounds goofy, but you are the only person who's gonna put that red next to that blue. Probably no one else will, unless they're copying you. <laughs> so it's a thing that you just shouldn't put push to the side if you can. It's always good to really give it some space, think what it is, and you don't have to understand it, but it's good to get to know it. question about the Samuel Pepys, uh, that is P-E-P-Y-S. P-E-P-Y-S? -E -P -E -P yeah, you wouldn't think it was Pepys, but okay. it's Pepys. Okay, all right, so <laughs> could you speak just a little bit about your process of singling out the words you singled out? I mean, the, in that in that time you dealt with all those diaries, like, how did you arrive at those? Yeah, so uh, I actually have one of my little notebooks here that has, like, so here's, like, a di an entry uh, January of 1664-65, when it's so he just switched years, and I just excerpted little bits from his. Um, so something I wrote down was, "Any ability extraordinary in anything." These are like just phrases taken. You wrote something in that, like a chicken, of all lines, <laughs> lost by running aground, to have been so, but got off on the twelfth. In his diary entry, there was a phrase, a strange attempt. We'll carry them away. So I, I re really just read all of his diaries, and whenever a phrase would hit me as something um, that had more meaning than just initially how he meant it made, or just created um, a, p a picture of something that was almost unpicturable, right? Like an attempt. We all know what an attempt is. It's something we agree we know when you're attempting to do something, but if you tried to make a picture of attempt, it's kind of hard. And that's where it's kind of gets interesting for me, is dealing with um, the murky bits of language because we share it, so we kind of, there's this place where we meet, and I say C-A-T, and we all know that's cat. We put it together in our head, but we're probably all seeing different cats. And <laughs> 
And so that, but we're doing that together, which to me is kind of great. Like we're all seeing a cat together, but different cats. So that's me. I think we all have that in common. But so, so yeah, so I was just, you know, on the 15th, spare them, heads in a paper, leisure and gravity. I mean, leisure and gravity, gosh, we, you know, we all have, I know what leisure looks like to me, but what does it look like to you? So, so that's where I was, that's where the play was coming in and in, in choosing what to write down. Things that had more space around, I think. Another question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were in that same um, hat dance show, and they were just three pieces on paper. Um, um, I wanted to try in those pieces that are in the in the gallery right now, rather than so the the line is done with paint, with black paint, or maybe it's any ink. I can't remember. And um, the color in those pieces are just uh, cut out pieces of fabric. Um, so I was, I was goofing around with, um, you know, kind of indicating paint without paint being there. Um, uh, so that they, they, when they are stuck on the paper, they also kind of create a ripple effect and it, it, it all works to the kind of the movement that's, you know, hopefully being evoked in the way that the paintings came together. Um, yeah, it was like, a, you know, obviously I, I go in all directions these days. So it was, while I was thinking of Pat Dan's, I thought, what does it do on paper? And that's how it came to me. questions, anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, I was happy for them to have that. Um, I mean, we, we think of painting or half thought of painting as a kind of a window or a doorway into another world. And so it, it was, Definitely an acknowledgement of, you know, what if, what if, what if you just looked inside someone's ear? Could you see their thoughts? Uh, you know, could you see what they're thinking? Or you know, what colors would you? What's going? What's on their mind? So, it, yeah, definitely the window was, was a happy. I, you know, I, it's a very stylized ear, so I actually almost emphasize the window. Well, you know, the funny thing is, well, apparently yes, because um, other people, some peers of mine were concerned that I was going to get to the end of Peeps and then what would I do? And so people actually gave me diaries to work with afterwards. And I looked at them, but I, it was, it was just, it was a serendipitous thing. So I, that Peeps came to me and I, I decided to, to consider that uh, uh, seriously. So I, I had first met those diaries when I was putting myself through school at UCLA and um, and I was working in the public library system and someone had donated the whole set and I just opened them up because I always looked at what was on the donation table and they were odd but you know at that time I was you know 20 something and I didn't really give it much thought but when I had reached this point in 2003 where I knew I wanted my work to change I didn't know how and I wanted to I'd, and then I knew maybe I wanted to send messages, but I didn't want to be the author. I, you know, literally walked into the used bookstore in my neighborhood, and they were there on the table, like right in front of me, the nine volumes of Peaks from, <laughs> from my childhood. And I opened them up, and it was like, you know, I, like they were me, use me. And so I, I did, <laughs> and it, nothing has presented itself to me that way in that manner at this point. So um, when it does, I may grab it up, but until then it has to have a little bit of gravitas. <laughs> well, I want to thank you all for coming, and um, I hope you get to see the show. And, and please keep doing what you're doing, because art is a beautiful thing. <laughs> thank you.